Hallelujah. If you can, you may be seated. As you turn your Bible to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Uh, this effort tonight is in keeping with the great need for foundational truths to be re-pioneered in the body of Christ. So we'll begin with the doctrine of sanctification. And we'll be taking it one after the other like that, like a basic believer's course until we complete all the 25 subjects that are captured in this course. First Corinthians chapter 6, beginning from verse number 9. First Corinthians 6, verse 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the power, by the Spirit of our God. Hallelujah. He says, this was how we used to be, but we have been washed, but we have been sanctified, but we have been justified. And how did all these things happen? They happened in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Now, so if you look at verse number 11, you are going to find some prescriptions that God had to put in place in order for him to transform us completely from the kind of people that were at home with the items that were mentioned from chapter 9 to chapter 10. And this approach as captured in verse 11, is what God does to an unbeliever when he comes into the kingdom of God in order for him to make him a new creation. Are you there? So if you look at the list, you are going to find sanctification on that list. It's a critical component of our experience. There is an aspect of sanctification that is already accomplished in the life of the believer. And there is an aspect of sanctification that is ongoing until the perfect day. Now, so we are going to take some time to explore the meaning of sanctification and how God achieves that in the life of of a believer if you are still with me say amen all right there are two scriptures that we are going to be doing business with during the course of this presentation 
and I call these two scriptures the two poles, two poles of sanctification. We have one pole that is this way, then we have the other pole that is that way. Two scriptures. The first pole is in eternity past. If we look into the records of God and try to analyze what God wants to achieve with man, we are going to find out that in God's policy direction for humankind, the strategy of sanctification is captured in eternity past. When we go into eternity future, you are going to see what God intends to achieve at the end of the day are you with me we'll look into the past and you will find it in god's policy document that he wants to achieve so and so when we look into the future through the eyes of prophecy you will see that god has accomplished exactly what he set out to do making it very clear to us that sanctification is not an option. It's part of God's strategy for man. Are you there with me now? So we'll take the two scriptures of interest. We established. And when we take the two scriptures, you will see what God had in mind. And then you also see through prophecy what God will accomplish. And you will find a common denominator that is in the two cases. In the first case, we need to begin from the book of Ephesians chapter 1. We'll read from verse 2 to verse 4. Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, for those of you online, you might find our output to be a bit noisy. The reason why it is noisy today is because it is raining heavily in the city of Makodi and uh, if we wait for this rain to stop um the service will come to an end so we need to make do with the time that we have uh so just bear with us ephesians chapter one from verse two to four you know i told you that the subject of ephesians chapter one is a research into God's intentions before the foundations of the world. This is one of the things that Apostle Paul was able to secure when he went to Arabia to tarry with God. And God unveiled his heart to him. There were, there were several people in scriptures that had terrific encounters with God. One of them is Moses. Moses was able to see the past of God, past in terms of the creative adventure of God and the history of the people of God. Moses was able to see that by revelation. Are you there? People like Apostle John were able to see into the future of God's economy, that which God intends to accomplish and that which God will accomplish at the end of the day. People like Apostle Paul saw into the full scope of God's eternal purpose. And this is very critical because it contains the syllabus that God intends to accomplish in the life of the average believer. So all of that is captured in the framework of what Paul downloads to us as God, God's eternal purpose. So I want to do a little reading to us to bring us up to speed with what God had in mind. If you find any building that is under construction, you will find that there is an architectural design. You find that there are engineering designs civil engineering designs electrical engineering designs mechanical engineering designs that are already drawn out that 
reveals the kind of building engagement that is going to be obtainable on the site. God also, before he sets out to accomplish anything, already has a plan in mind. And that plan is very, very exhaustively conveyed in the book of Ephesians chapter 1, beginning from verse number 2. All right. It says, Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. So the first thing we see here is that God has blessed us already. God has blessed us with spiritual blessings that are domiciled in heavenly places in Christ. Are you there? Right. I need to explain that. I think I've explained this scripture before. So this scripture is no longer strange to you. So verse... For according as he had chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Now, we are going into the archives of the eternal purpose. We are going into the secrets that God had in his heart before he set out in the adventure of creation. Are you there? Now, this scripture reveals that God exercised his authority. The word chosen in this scripture suggests that God had choices. There were so many people available but God decided to choose you to be he chose you by an act of his authority and included you in Christ Jesus that's a big deal hallelujah and it's, it's needful for you to understand that he chose you when you were yet a seed of eternity he chose you before you took on shape and form he chose you when you existed in his mind. And when he chose you by an act of his authority, even before time began, he included you in Christ before the foundation of the world. The question is this, why is God exercising his authority on my life? What does he want to achieve? It is captured there also that we should be holy and i need to explain to us are you there so he chose you with the hope he chose you with the expectation that you should be holy very critical He chose you and desired when he chose you that when you come into time the option of life that you will choose to live is described in the word holy so I need to define to us what exactly does it mean when we say something is holy the first definition of holiness is different. And I'm, I'm giving you these definitions from the original root words that were used and translated as holy. To be holy means to be different. That's the first definition of holiness. To be what? different 
different. To be holy means to be set apart. And I need to explain to us what it means to be set apart. The meaning of being set apart biblically is that you are no longer common. The opposite of being set apart is common. And I, I need to explain that because you may not understand it just by the terminologies. If I go to the marketplace and I find four cups in the market, let's say 10 cups in the market, and I buy all 10 cups, and I decide that I'm going to give two of the cups to the house of God. I take eight cups at, to my house, right? The moment you bring those two cups to the house of God, and the priest comes and anoints the cups, from the moment the cups are anointed, the cups can no longer serve the common use of cups. The only, the only duties to which these cups can be put are duties that are captured in the house of God. Are you there? It's the same cup. The same as the one you bought in your house. When people visit you, you can use the cups in your house to serve them water. But those cups that are in the temple that have been anointed can no longer be used for that common use. So when we say something is set apart, it means that it is only available for divine use. It might be the same thing, but because it has been dedicated to God, it is only available for divine use. And just in case you decide to take that thing that is only available for divine use and you take it to the market or to a restaurant so that it can be used commonly, God will appear and fight because it was dedicated to him and it is supposed to be used exclusively by him so when we say something is holy first of all we mean it is different do you realize that those cups in your house even though they are the same in terms of the design and the cups in the temple are no longer the same they are different in terms of usage the ones in the temple can no longer be used for the common things that the one at home will be put to use for so there is a difference between the two even though they look alike is there are you there now secondly they are set apart that means they cannot be used for any common usage they can only be used for divine usage Are you there? Now the subject of holiness is, is a deep subject that we need to take gradually. We need to take a step at a time so that you can understand it in full scope. So we have one definition of holiness to mean that something is different. Are you there? Then another definition, something is set apart did you get it all right i think the third definition is like the second one which is something is separate 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 it's different it is set apart and it is separate so if we go back to this scripture in the book of Ephesians, chapter 1 verse 4 and we read the scripture with that understanding the bible says according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be huh? we should be different we should be set apart 
we should be separate. The other day, I was counseling with a lady. That, that's some time ago, like six years ago. We're not in this building here. And um, I think I arrested her in service. I arrested her by the Holy Ghost. And after the arrest, uh, she was found to be... I've been in the deliverance ministry for many years. So if I see how difficult it is for me to cast out a spirit, I know what kind of spirit it is. The most difficult spirit that is in my own practice of deliverance. The most difficult spirit there is for me to cast out is a spirit of sexual perversion. When you find someone that is a lesbian, someone that is a homosexual. Now, I've been in the corridor of deliverance for a very long time. So I noticed that she was oozing with a foul smell in the congregation. And that smell is not physical. All right, so I picked it up, I traced it to the lady, and I commanded the spirit to come out. So I saw the same reaction in her as I used to see in people that had, do you understand that? So I invited her to the office, and I, I began to interview her. I said, you are a lesbian. She said, yeah, she didn't deny that. I said, okay, how many of you, what, what is the number of les lesbians on Benin State University campus? At the time, which is six years ago, she said uh, about 550. About what? So those 550 people are common. That's the normal usage of... Do you understand that? But when you step into holiness, you become what? Different. When you step into holiness, you become set apart. Your body is no longer available for plunder. You are now the temple of the Holy Spirit. And because you are a warehouse for the Holy Spirit, your body is sacred. Your body cannot be common. Your body cannot be available. The implication of being separate, the implication of being different, the implication of being set apart is a huge implication. The other day I was, those days, I'm talking about 20 something years ago. I was, I just came into the room, my two roommates were talking about how many women they've slept with under various circumstances and situations. And um, then I asked me, how many have you explored? I said, no, I've not explored, I know. Huh? Yeah, you guys. I said, no, you are getting it wrong. I'm different. I'm set apart. Are you there? I'm not common. I'm not in the market. You are getting it wrong. Because if you don't know that... You are a vessel of God. Those people that are into immorality might make you think that you are missing something. I assure you, you are missing nothing. What you are missing is HIV. You are missing all kinds of... I am separate. Please tell, speak to yourself. I am separate. I am different. And I am set apart. Only God can operate me. Only God can use me. I'm not available for public use. I'm not available for common use. I am separated entirely to God. So I began to teach on holiness. Teach them holiness. And I made them understand that in terms of of cerebral and lingual power i i best them i am far more cerebral than them i'm far more equipped in lingual powers than them so my ability to convince people exceeds theirs a hundred times but i don't use my resources to achieve 
such things because I am different. And I began to teach them about difference. That part of the evidences that show that you have met with God is that he leaves you different. Your own specimen becomes an isolated case that is different from what is common, what is available, what is known, because you are set apart for God. In fact, your expression, are you with me? Your expression in this matter, because it is God that will eventually use you. So you are set apart for a specific purpose in God. And it is for that purpose alone that you are suitable. You are not suitable for any other purpose apart for that which you are set apart to accomplish in God. So when I finished the lecture, they felt terrible. I didn't ask them to give their life to Christ. I, I, I left them to think about the state of being common and the state of being set apart. So it's in the eternal purpose of God that we will be holy, will be set apart entities, will be functionaries that are, 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 can only be used by God. That's the way and the only way God's eternal purpose will be accomplished. If each believer becomes set apart and he recognizes that he's a vessel that only God can operate. Trust me, trust me, huh? You are going to find Satan on the rampage trying to m apply your beauty to accomplish something that is not within the scope of being set apart. There are many beautiful ladies in this place. Satan will tell you that the, the current market value of your beauty in the market, in the common place, it will give you an insight into how valuable you are in terms of Naira and Kobo in the marketplace. But unfortunately for Satan, you are not common. Except it, it downs on you that you are not common, you will find yourself in the rat race of the market, of the common place. I am not common. I am not going to be used to achieve something that is not captured in the purpose of God. The reason why God had to exercise his authority is will be realized. That is, his authority was exercised to choose me in him before the foundation of the world. That effort of God is going to be jeopardized if I don't turn out to become separate, if I don't turn out to become different, and if I don't turn out to become what? Set apart. Satan will fight to ensure that you are not different. He will fight to ensure that you are not separate. He will fight to ensure that you are not what? Set apart. When he sees that you are holding on to your conviction, he will bring people to preach to you. Just like my roommate, we were two preachers, and then we now became roommates. He is more senior to me in preaching. So he called me and said, shut up, sit down. I want to teach you ministry. So I was listening to him. He said, no man can solve the problem of fornication. <laughs> this, is a, this is a lecture. <laughs> this is a lecture. This is an intentional lecture. He it, said, it, no man can solve the problem of fornication. So what you do is you fornicate, but hide it. Because the day you are caught, the anointing will leave you. As long as you can keep it secret, the anointing will cooperate with you. Everything will cooperate with you. God will cooperate with you. Satan will cooperate. But the day you are caught, nobody will cooperate with you. Everything will work against you. So that's the secret of ministry. You can, fornicate. you can become common. Common in your secret life. Then you, you, you disguise, you act as though you were separate in your public life. When your life in secret is a contradiction with what you display in public, what you are is false. 
What's your eyes? What? A man's false ministry begins when he begins to violate the principle of being different, of being separate, and of being set apart. The moment you begin to violate that, there is nothing you do in the open that is right. Because fundamentally, you are in digression from the expectation that God had in mind when he decided to exercise his authority before the foundations of the world to include you in Christ. That effort that he made is with the hope that you will decide to be separate. The moment you decide to be separate, the effort he made will become visible for all to see that this one is not common. This one belongs to me. This one doesn't have any other assignment other than the assignment that I assigned to him. You get that idea? So this is the policy. This is the revelation of that position that was on the heart of God before the foundation of the world. He wants to have functionaries that are holy. So because this was God's plan, all the strategies that God put in place were deployed to achieve this holiness. You get that? Okay, let me show you another scripture. First Peter chapter 1 verse 15 and 16. First Peter chapter 1 verse 15 Oh my, no, 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 no. Wait, leave first Peter. Let's go to another one that is more distant into the future. Revelation chapter 21, verse 2, and uh, verse 9, and verse 10. Revelation 21, 2, then we'll do 9 and 10. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride at dawn for her husband. There is a metaphor that is used in, in fact, this scripture, this scripture is a collocation of metaphors. I will need to explain the metaphors. One of uh, the metaphors is city. You must have heard Jesus said that you are the light of the world. How many of you still remember that? All right. Jesus did not only say you are the light of the world, Jesus also said that you are a city that is set upon a hill that cannot be healed. So that city that you are is what is being illustrated in the book of Revelation chapter 21. This city is a full description of the ultimate church. And what I mean by the ultimate church is the church that has gone through process and God has taken wrinkles and spots away from her, and she is fully adorned in the apparel of glory and in the same, on the same frequency with her husband. So this is our destiny as a people. And the first description of that city is what? Holy city. It means that the vision that God had which was a vision that we should be holy. Are you there? And he sustained this vision before the foundation of the world. In this city now, we see that God achieved what he intended to do because you are this city. This is the vision accomplished in this metaphor that is used to describe us. I, John, saw the holy city New Jerusalem, coming down from God, out of heaven, prepared as a bride. Does that metaphor strike any chord with you? Huh? Prepared as a what? It means no matter how we are, that we are not decked in holiness, we are not yet ready to meet our Lord. The decking of holiness is, is the final adornment that we all must carry in order for us to be worthy 
of her husband. So I just showed you two poles of spiritual reality. In the pole that is before the foundation of the world, you could see that God's intention was to crystallize a holy people. Part of the meaning of God's eternal purpose is that God wants children. He wants children. That's part of what made God to set out and to begin to create. He wants children, but not just any kind of children. Children that are in the image of his firstborn son, even Jesus Christ. All right? The, the desire of his heart will be satisfied if God can have children in the likeness of Jesus Christ. So because of that, he preordained us. He desired that we will be holy. And part of what he did to ensure that we'll turn out holy is that he included us in Christ by an act of his authority. That's a mystery. Don't try to understand it with your mind. It's a mystery. It's beyond your intellectual capacity. He included you in Christ because he wanted you to turn out being what? Holy. And the moment you are armed with the understanding of the fact that you were designed to be different. You will no longer be intimidated by the parade of sin that takes place in your city. We were driving home yesterday, and I saw a, what they call a nightclub. They just, they just opened a new nightclub somewhere on my route. And I laughed. The reason why I laughed is because in the next eight months, it has closed. In, in fact, they, I closed it. I closed it. Yesterday. But it will take like eight months for the full manifestation of what I did yesterday to find expression. The, the problem with the owner of the nightclub is that he's, he's establishing a nightclub in my city. If he goes to Boko, he will succeed. But you see, this one is my city. Everything that is in this city is compelled by our presence to be different. It's compelled by our presence to be set apart. Is compelled by our presence to be what? Separate. Satan has a lot of use, uses for your masculine nature, the way you are looking so gallant. He has uses for your gallantry. But you see, you are different. You are not up on his shelf. You are not available to be deployed in the, in the likeness of Satan's vision because we do not belong to Satan. We are separate unto God and only God can deploy us. That's the mentality that we are supposed to carry. I just showed you that before time began, God wanted children that are holy. Children that are separate to him. Because that's the only way God will be known. Stay with me. Or you are not with me. The only way God will be known is that you decide to be separate to him. So he now possesses you. He now begins to instruct you. You now begin to live for him. So when people see you living for him, through your life, God is the one that is on display because you are not living for yourself or you are not getting it. You are living for him. So because of that, your life becomes a prism, an avenue through which it can be known. If you are not separate unto him and you are available for him and you are also common, the story of your life will be distorted. Nobody will be able to know God through your vessel because your, your, your life will be an expression of a bipolar reality. <laughs> you know what I mean by bipolar? It's a psychiatric situation. It's a psychiatric situation. Now, so, now that God desired holy children and at the end of the day he will have holy children so what is in between in view of the above don't worry i will define what sanctification is just stay with me okay in view of the above god desired holy children god will have holy children and in between we have scriptures like first peter chapter 1 verse 15 and 16 1 Peter chapter 1, 
verse 15 and 16 is the charge that is in between God's eternal purpose and God's ultimate actualization of his intent. We have scriptures like this. But as he which has called you is holy, so be holy in all manner of conversation. The word conversation in that scripture is ancient English, which means manner of life. So, holiness is supposed to be revealed in your manner of living. In your manner of living, we can tell if you are separate or not. In your manner of living, we can tell if you are set apart to God or not. In your manner of living, we can tell if you are common or different or not. Is that clear? So, this is the charge that the apostle is given in time. And the reason for this emphasis is because God desired it. And at the end, God will have it. But you see, God's purposes are constant, but his men can change. Because of that, we need to be charged. Like uh, the apostle is charging us now so that we will not change. We will become part of the fulfillment of God's dream at the end of the day. He said, just as he that has called you is holy, so be holy in all manner of your conduct. Your practice of holiness can be evidenced in your conduct. And as we as we travel in the scripture, one after the other, you begin to understand what I'm talking about. Because it's a subject that covers the scripture. So we'll take it precept upon precept, line upon line. Then you will understand what it means when we say someone is sanctified. 16, because as it is written, be ye holy for I am holy. So what is sanctification? By definition. To be sanctified means to be made holy. Which is to be separated unto God and saturated with God. Did you get that? To be sanctified is to be made holy, which is to be separated unto God and saturated with God as the Holy One, the one who is different and distinct from everything that is common. To be sanctified is to be made holy which is to be separated unto God and saturated with God as the Holy One. The one who is different and distinct from everything that is common. Did you get that? And the guys on the control... Can you type out this definition and put it on the dashboard? To be sanctified is to be made holy, which is to be separated unto God and saturated with God as the Holy One. Comma. The one who is different and distinct from everything that is common. We are separated and saturated. So there are two things that makes for sanctification. One is separation unto God. Two is saturation with God. Are you there? So can you see the quiet, there's a quiet theological difference between sanctification and holiness. But I don't want to trouble you with those terminologies. Hmm? But to sanctify is the process of making 
holy. Are you there? Making you holy. So that's what sanctification about is about. Is the process by which we are made holy. That process is called sanctification. So this is the definition. To be sanctified means to be made holy, which is separated unto God and saturated with God as the Holy One, one which is different and distinct from everything that is common. I conducted a very detailed research on authorities on this subject, and this is the most accurate holistic definition that I could make out of all my efforts. If you are still with me, say, Amen. Now that, now that you have gotten it, I would like to introduce a scripture quickly so that you can understand the scope of our sanctification. If we say that sanctification means to be made holy, means to be separate, and then saturated with God. See? We are separate from common use. We are separate from mundane use. And just like I said, Satan is going to be advertising options of yourself that can be put to mundane use. You, all through your life, you will find him coming into your space, trying to bend your mind, trying to point you to common uses. That's a battle that you are going to have to face all through your life. But the idea of sanctification is that God wants to make us holy. God wants us to be separate so that he can saturate us with himself. And this himself is different. Is what? Distinct. And is different from everything that is common. Now this suggests that you are going to be put to a use that is hallowed. And in order for you to be faithful in that use to which God puts you, because that use to which God puts you is such use that you require God to saturate you to be able to accomplish. You there? Part of the reasons why I prayed and prayed today and prayed and prayed today is because speaking, preaching, talking doesn't come to me naturally. I'm not a natural talker. I stammer naturally. So in order for me to be able to talk to you in this fluent release of English language, it's proof that I've, I've been saturated. The use that God will put you to is not a use that you can accomplish naturally. It's not a use that you have natural capacity to accomplish so that you will need to seek his saturation in order for you to find the much needed empowerment to be able to prosecute that use to which God wants to put you. You will now discover that it is the presence of God that saturates you. Oh my God. I will tell you what that presence will be doing inside of you anytime you get saturated. Anytime you get saturated. In the place of prayer, as you are calling on the name of the Lord, he's saturating you. There is something he's accomplishing on your inside. It's a work of sanctification. And we define sanctification as making something what? Holy. The minimum requirement of what God will accept from you and me is called holiness. Because that is contained in his original plan so god will not accept anything that is not on the level of holiness so when you find people emphasizing money how to make money how to press the buttons of favor how to press this kind of stuff and how to arrive how to break through and there is no emphasis equivalent emphasis in the eternal purpose which captures that part of what will qualify us to be accepted in the eyes of God is holiness. 
if we don't have as much emphasis in holiness as we have in prosperity, what is going on is deception. Because the man thinks that, okay, he has acquired all the money in the world. Now he is in a position to be able to do the will of God. Then you will discover that what qualifies you to do the will of God is God himself when it comes to saturate. And if your vessel is not separated unto him, he will not have the opportunity to saturate. God will not accept anything that is short of holiness. Are you there? Now, those of us that teach the Bible, most of you have already stumbled into the teaching anointing, probably because of the grace that is in this house. Hmm? Those of us that teach the Bible, you must understand that your judgment is going to be far more stricter. Because these things that I'm teaching you, I've studied them, I know it, that is the mind of God. Therefore, I cannot do otherwise. Part of the reason why I'm living the life I'm living is because of you people. Because I will lose my credibility to stand before you if I break fundamental laws of separation, of holiness. Everywhere I've been to, I've seen opportunities to violate my conviction. Because Satan is a good advertiser. He advertises products, all kinds of... In fact, the other day we came to a place somewhere in Europe. May the Lord give you understanding. And the door to my apartment where I'm going to stay, two ladies with big... Okay, let me... So I knew I wasn't safe in the environment. So I had to tell Philip, Philip, go into that, all those rooms, check it, open the toilets, open, and confirm that there's no product like this hiding in the corner that I'm going to be. Now, I'm not a loose man. Don't get me wrong. But you see, that, that kind of life I'm living is because I am know that I am not common. I'm not coming. God, in his internal purpose, requires holiness, and that is what he will have. So I cannot come and deceive myself and say, okay, uh, hey, this one is good. Oh. It can't be good because I am not what? Come on. Went somewhere we saw some people and they said, do you know that I used to have thick glasses on you? You prayed in my body and my eyes were healed. Oh, glory to God. I thought that was all. The person wanted an investment. You know the investment I'm talking about. The person... So if, if you could pray for my body and my eyes are healed where I am, what if you invest in me? What will it create? That miracle will be permanent <laughs> now the reason why such an investment cannot take place is because satan will haunt you in the office you will see oh my god he will haunt you don't think that you are fine that's why they are haunting you you are wrong it's because satan cannot hurt you until you become common when you become common you become where he has dominion he has authority he can do he can make nonsense of your life. We're in Ethiopia. And when you use the Ethiopian Airways, you arrive at Addis Ababa. They will lodge you at Skylight Hotel. Skylight. Skylight Hotel is it's a 1,000 bed room hotel. We don't have any of such hotels in Nigeria. One, huh? Is Nikon up to 1,000? Okay. O only Nikon 1,000 bed. So you see people coming in, going out, coming in, going out, because that's the hotel. The hotel is owned by the airline. So we came to the place. And they said there are two lifts, lift A and lift B. So, but 
The person saw the way we were. He said, but I advise you to use lift A. What's the meaning of that? So when we got to where lift A was, the normal people there were too much. So we now traced lift B. I now discovered why he advised. There were ladies there almost naked, waiting for anyone that would take them to his room. It's not just their nakedness that is the problem. They had one energy. There was a very terrible energy that was at work in that place. If you don't belong to Jesus, you belong to them. The, idea, the reason why Satan is fighting is because he wants you to become common. Are you there? And we cannot become... If you become common, you are in a domain that Satan can strip you of your glory. As long as you are separated unto God, Satan has no power over you. Do you get that? All right, so let's move on with a few scriptures. I need to show you the scope of our sanctification. This sanctification, this, this making holy project that God has... It has a scope. And you find the scope in the book of First Thessalonians chapter 5. In First Thessalonians chapter 5, we have a long list of the commandments of church life. You see, in this environment, of this, this is church, okay? We have brethren, we have... So in this environment of church life, Apostle Paul gives commandments to govern church life. In um, First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 6, first commandment, first commandment, Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 16 sorry 1 6 chapter 5 verse 16 this is the first commandment what's the first commandment rejoice evermore now I don't have time to go into this teaching to tell you why is it that the apostle had to isolate this commandment and say hey make sure you rejoice because part of what the devil wants to do is to ensure that it takes away your joy. Oh, Jesus Christ. Your joy. Just like, yeah, Satan wants to take away your joy. And if Satan takes away your joy, it's, it, it's, um, it's, it's like you are uncovered. You are accessible. You are available. So he says, rejoice evermore that's the first commandment second commandment next verse he said pray without ceasing so in church life part of what we do is the labor of prayer the reason why prayer is so important is because of how weak you are how weak i am are you with me during COVID, if you breathe in, you die. You just, your crime was that you just, you entered an infected area and you were still breathing. That's how weak you are. You drink water, bad water, you die. You eat bad food, you die. That's how weak we are. And because of that weakness, the commandment says, pray without seeds you will need the help of god every single moment you will need the help of god every single day so in the practice of church life apostle paul instructs that every member of the body of christ must become proficient in the way of prayer because of how weak how insufficient we are Sometimes when I pray, my room becomes small, so I just move out. 
So when I'm moving like that, the security man would think I need company. So he will come and say, hey, this is the... He is not aware of the fact that I'm just practicing the gospel. I will not answer him. When he finishes and he discovers that I'm not answering, he will, he will run away and go on. But he will try first. Pray without ceasing. It's one of the commandments of church life. Yes? Next verse. In everything, give thanks. He, he, these are scriptures that do not carry maybe... It's not suggestive. These are commandments. In everything, give thanks. Why? For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Turn everything to thanksgiving. Naked I came from my mother's womb. Naked I shall return. The Lord has given and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. A man that converts everything to thanksgiving will never be discouraged. The antidote to discouragement is thanksgiving. Perpetual thanksgiving. You can't get him to despair because he understands the sovereignty of God and that God God's thoughts about him and thoughts of good and not of evil continually. So even though he cannot understand it, he will still give thanks because he knows that God is on his side. Next verse. Quench not the spirit. Quench not the spirit. Quench not the Holy Ghost. Shala came to visit me today, and while I was talking with him, the Holy Spirit quickened the scripture into my spirit man. The meaning of that is, leave Shala, go up, and I want to talk to you now. I want to talk to you. So I, even though Shala is my comrade, is my comrade, is one of the best friends I have in this, on this earth. Yeah, it's my comrade. We come a long way. We come a long way. Hallelujah. So, in fact, it was difficult, but I had to. The spirit has been kindled. The commandment is quench him not. If I stay with Shala longer than I did, so I know when to leave. Because I, I have survived by the Holy Ghost all these years, and I know when he kindles himself like a fire. It's a quench not the Holy Ghost. So I know that personally. I also know this congregationally are you there i saw a preacher ministering and as he was ministering he was ministering the holy spirit broke out two ladies fell under the power somebody began to manifest and the preacher said hey i don't like this i don't like it and he quenched the holy ghost i knew i knew that there was nothing of heaven he could accomplish in that meeting. He quenched him. He quenched the Holy Ghost. It's one of the commandments of church life. And when you quench him like that, it will become more difficult for him to come into the open congregation to show himself. His presence is like a snail, very sensitive. If you don't invite him rigorously, and if you are not comfortable with his presence, he will depart. And there are many churches in Nigeria that he left 12 years ago because he was quenched. 14 years ago, 25 years ago. Hallelujah. When he leaves, you begin to see that witches will begin to fill the pews. When he leaves, you begin to see the frequent deaths will begin to take place. When he leaves, you begin to see strange situations find expression. Unexplainable deaths will hit because there is nothing available to challenge it. Are you there? So he said, quench not this. We don't quench him individually and by God's good, good, good grace, we will not quench him congregationally. I know a very anointed man. If, 
if he comes out in the open because he prays a lot, comes out in the open and he begins to shake people, they'll start falling. And, and it's not in a service, though. Maybe railway station, police station, bank, and he's shaking people, they'll just start falling. So he now went to God and said, this is embarrassing. Lord, this is embarrassing. Can you take this thing away? And the Lord took, see, today, <laughs> the Holy Spirit has to come back. If I'm even praying for that dimension to go to Urukuma Ketan, <laughs> I'm praying for it. And scatter the whole place and get the attention of all the traders there and speak about Jesus. I'm praying for it. I don't have enough. Oh, Jesus. You see, oh, are you there? Are you there? Try preaching to a white man. The only, because the moment you show up black, he just believes that there's nothing you can give him. <laughs> that you are in need, you are desperately in need. So, but when you now bring the Holy Spirit, you will clear his doubts. Then he will realize you have something to bring to the table. Quench not, quench not Oh, Jesus. You see, he's coming. I'm talking about him. He's coming. And I didn't want him to come today. I, 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 I just want to talk, you know. Quench not the Holy Ghost. <laughs> no, that's not quenching. Me, I, me, I have my own plan. <laughs> Quench not. Quench not the Spirit. Okay, now, okay, okay. I, I won't quench. But wait, wait. Let me give you one scripture before we decide not to quench. Next verse. He said, despise not. What? Prophecy. I just came back from Jaws. Went to preach for my comrade uh, Gideon. They just built an auditorium. So, yes, we need to clap about that. Yes. So I began to teach about prophecy. When I finished the lecture, then I asked us to go, asked the congregation to go for practical. Then I got, I asked if there were people in the congregation that God was speaking to. Some people stood up. Because in the practice of church life, the expectation is that one or two should prophesy and some other people should judge. That's the practice. So that everybody can go home with the perception of the mind of God. You understand that? So we practice that thing. So it, it, one sister stood up that God spoke to her. She said what God told, what she claimed God told her. When we analyze it, it was true. Another guy stood up. He said what he claimed God told him. I said, no, no. He even brought a scripture to prove it. The scripture was contradicting what he was saying. I said, see, are you there? The fact that someone prophesies wrong is not enough reason for us to quench prophecy. I remember, we can always judge a prophecy and know if it's from God and embrace it. But we will suffer loss if we do not allow this channel to be available for God to be able to speak spontaneously to us in a congregational set setting. It means that we have become blind. I remember one of the most powerful churches on the planet, somewhere in Europe. The prayer group, anytime they go for prayer, a prophecy breaks out. I don't want to say the, pro the prophecy publicly because we are on online. Okay, let me paraphrase it. This is the content of the prophecy that the ministry should not invite ministers from a certain nation. That's the prophecy. Like, came once came twice they copied it out took it to the general vasia once twice but if the general vasia wants to invite people to the church is from that country are you following it continued like that it continued like that those ministers from that country 
brought strange things to that church. A few years later, the candlestick of the church in heaven was withdrawn because of that disobedience. I met people that were in that prayer group that were eyewitnesses to the prophecies that came forth. I met them. They are the ones that gave me this information. He said, despise not. What? Prophesy. Did you get that? 20. Where are we? Yeah, go on. Yeah, we are still on course. Yeah. He said, prove all things. Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from all appearance of what? Evil. I don't have time. Then verse 23. Now the commandments are fi finished. He wants to give them a benediction. He says, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Can you see the scope of sanct sanctification? It includes your spirit. It includes your soul. And includes your mortal body. For the Bible says that God intends to sanctify you wholly. To sanctify your spirit, your soul, and your mortal body. So you are going to begin to see that the emphasis of sanctification as we go on, this is a mere introduction. As we go on, you will begin to see some things that God is requiring for your spirit. So that the process of sanctification will go on. Some things that God will require for your soul. So that the process of sanctification will go on. Some things that God will require for your body. There are body commandments. There are soul commandments. There are spirit commandments. Because the vision that God has is to sanctify you wholly. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. He wants to saturate your spirit. He wants to saturate your soul. He wants to saturate your body. So that everything about you speaks him. Speaks his glory. You become the object through which he can be known in our generation. Because you are separated unto him to serve his will. To transmit his ideals. To manifest his wisdom. You are a theater. Through which he can display his ideals. So there is a call. It says that the very God of peace sanctify you holy. That after giving us instructions for church life. So when you do all these things, I want to pray for you. That the very God of peace will sanctify you wholly. Then he told us what holy means. Spirit, soul, and body. All made holy. So there's nothing you do with your body that is filthy. It is separated unto you. There's nothing you do with your mind that is filthy. There are regulations for your mind. These days, there's so much pornography in Facebook. And the jokes people crack up. Death in keeping with the command for holiness. There are some channels you need to block. 
I'm not saying leave Facebook. It's very important. In fact, that's where I, I get my news. Right? Some of us don't have... There's a television in my room and one in the sitting room. I've not... Is he up? Have I? I've not watched it up to seven times. Seven. Seven. It's there. It's like a piece of furniture. Do you understand? I've not watched it. So I... I get news from Facebook. Okay. Hey, oh! It's very important to me. But there are channels you need to block because he wants to sanctify you. What? Oh. When you become saturated holy, it's easy for you to pick, to hear him, to know his mind. Oh, Jesus. Give me volume there. Give me volume. This is the only friend I have, Jesus. Sometimes he can saturate the room. I can't sleep. Can't sleep. What he's saying is, hey, wake up. I'm here already. Jesus. 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 Saturated. Woo. We'll speak in tongues for two minutes and uh, so that we can find out what he's saying. For two minutes. For two minutes. For two minutes. He's so benign. Horia Kapelama. Nisasole kembroske tobile. Ekobamba hasakila. Mebro koske. We were designed to contain you. We were designed to express you. We understand that it's your desire to saturate us with yourself so that your life can save us can save us from every trace of the fall that is yet outstanding in our lives we see what you are doing and we yield we cooperate with you we stand with you oh my god oh my god now Choir, can you lead, lead us in this song? We sing it four times. Can you stand on your feet in a moment? He must be honored. He must be honored. He must be honored in my life every day. He must be honored. Jesus must be honored. Must be honored. He be honored. He Those days when I used to preach in the villages in Idoma land, there's a song we used to sing. Then. Listen to this, my song. And then give the mic to an Idoma member of that choir. Mm. That was the revival song we sang in the bush. You are in the spirit. You are in the spirit. I won't watch your ma. I won't watch your ma. He told me. I said, I won't watch your ma. He told me. I will watch your ma. I will watch your ma. I will watch your ma. I will watch 
Somebody had a nightmare yesterday night. You had a very terrible nightmare yesterday night. And in this nightmare, you saw some of the dead members of your family. Dead members of your family coming to have fellowship with you. And while you were in the environment of that dream, it didn't look strange to you. The fellowship was flowing. Uh, Pastor Tony, find out from this young man. I want to watch your mind. 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 I did I want what your I did I want what your mind. I want what I I want what your mind. I 